sometimes pains me to see the knots conservatives, especially in the United States, are prepared to tie themselves in debating anthropogenic climate change. I don't object, as such, to the unrelenting slanders heaped upon myself and others who support concerted action to forestall global climate change, the insinuation that we don't care about liberty or prosperity, that we are sheep blindly led by a cynical liberal elite, that we use climate change as a bully pulpit to build an overmighty state. Even if all the above were true, our position would still be factually correct, if morally hazardous. What I object to is the combination of scientific illiteracy and downright lies displayed by the conservative right in refuting us. Lies first. The author of the video I'm replying to seems to have come to the conclusion that I advocate a ban on SUVs and other carbon-intensive activities. Not true. I advocate a carbon tax of between 50 and and $100 per tonne of CO2 equivalent submitted to be paid by primary energy providers. I would couple this tax with a corresponding reduction in income taxes. Thus, there would be no net change in government revenues, but a change in relative prices which would discourage carbon-intensive activities and encourage carbon-efficient ones. A fuel tax is fairer and less economically disruptive than a tax on earning income. It is vitally important to understand, for both self-styled liberals and conservatives, that there are a great many positions being advanced in this debate. My position, for example, is at odds with President Obama, who prefers a cap-and-trade scheme along with government subsidies. I believe he is wrong to advocate both of these policies, although I prefer cap-and-trade to nothing at all. Now, the science. The first point the user makes is to challenge a claim I'd never made, namely that heat from trapping cloud trapped clouds accelerates global warming. I don't personally think this is true. The evidence is that cloud cover, if anything, has a slight cooling effect and markedly decreases the daytime-nighttime temperature spreads. The mechanism of global warming is not cloud-based, but carbon-gas-based. The next point is also not an attack on the fundamental mechanism of climate change, but on a positive feedback mechanism, namely that we may be overestimating carbon gas emissions from soil. But even in the most basic, stripped-down models where all such feedbacks are ignored, the increase in CO2 levels from 400 to 550 parts per million will have substantial effects corresponding to at least 2 degrees Celsius, all other things remaining equal. Now let's just clear up what I meant by that last statement. This chart shows a possible path for global temperatures over the next 50 years. Lots of variation, but a slight downward trend. Bear in mind this chart is completely made up and is only meant to serve as an illustrative example of how descriptive statistics works. Now, climate change proponents such as myself aren't saying that global warming will override all the other mechanisms going on here and cancel out all the variation, but it will add some temperature increase in any given year, increasing as time goes on. This next chart shows what that would look like. At the start, the gap between business-as-usual scenario and the warming scenario is small, but as time goes on, the distance increases and we get a slight upward trend. Notice the other drivers affect things in the same way. The peaks and troughs are the same, but there is still warming. It is important to grasp this very basic concept of descriptive stats, the principle of trends versus short-term variation, and I worry that my detractors don't quite get it yet. The author of the video then makes a point which I'm afraid I'll have to leave open. He claims that computer models use the assumption that the atmosphere is infinitely thick, and that this assumption makes the models totally invalid, according to an ex-NASA mathematician, a Hungarian whose name I won't even attempt to pronounce, but will link to his paper and rebuttal. I emailed a friend at the Hadley Centre in Exeter with this criticism, and the reply I received was similar to the rebuttal I'll link to, so I won't bother repeating it here. My friend also mentioned that the criticism is only valid for whole atmosphere grey body modelling, whereas most contemporary models work on an extrapolated individual interactions basis. Suffice to say, I do not find the argument at all compelling, and it does not apply to the models I base my understanding of climate change on at all. I have not much comment to make on the final study he presents either, save to point out that two of the authors, David Douglas and Fred Singer, Flash up on Exxon Secrets, a website that documents ExxonMobil's unfortunate habit of funding outspoken climate sceptics in preference to more balanced academics. Fred Singer admits to receiving at least $10,000 in backhanders from Exxon, and was implicated in a leaked memo from the American Petroleum Institute planning a $5 million campaign to, and I quote the memo, undercut prevailing scientific wisdom. This doesn't mean their science is necessarily wrong, merely that we should be highly suspicious given the vast array of better qualified scientists holding the opposite viewpoint. And I think that about wraps it up. The lesson from this video is that a good scientific education and critical thinking are more acutely essential than ever if humanity is to weather the challenges that a warmer, more populous and more globalised Earth will inevitably throw at us. The peddling of pseudoscience and conspiracy theories may sell books and attract ratings, but it is irresponsible and must be combated.